Hi, Brother Roy here, Old School Bible Baptist Ministries. Well, hey, guess what? Video number 22 in our series, Are You Super Duper Serious About Knowing Your Bible? And we should be finishing with the last chapter of Dr. David Walker's great book in the series, Rightly Dividing the Bible, Volume 2, Unwrapping dispensational truth and we are in chapter 13 amen and video 22 should complete the series and uh now my next series i'm gonna do and what we're gonna do is we're gonna go with right here brother kevin mann the first mention study Bible. And what Brother Man does in the first mention study Bible is at the end of every book of the Bible, he has a section on nuggets. Nuggets in Genesis. Nuggets in Exodus. All right? And I'll tell you, the stuff that my brother digs out, and he's a math guy, and I'm not, and look, he... Just like Dr. Walker did here, the guy is just the best in the business. It's phenomenal information. So I thought maybe we'd go through the first mention study Bible and cover some of these nuggets in each of the books. And I thought we'd call the series, Are You Nuts for Nuggets? Amen. So I, that's what we'll do next. But today, let's finish up. Are you super duper serious about knowing your Bible? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Father, for, for teaching us to rightly divide and lead us into all truth. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, hey, you know what to do? <laughs> Pull up that good cup of hot coffee. Oh, that's good coffee. That's good coffee. If I do say so myself, I make good coffee. Okay. Pull up a chair. Let's get into this. All things new. Amen. What man ruins, God redeems. Atheists wrongly assume that God does not exist because of the preponderance of suffering. The evil that is in the world. They reason away the existence of God, alleging that if there is a God and he is good, he would stop all the bad. But this erroneous reasoning overlooks the explicit teaching of the scripture. God will indeed end all evil, sin, and suffering once and for all. The malicious minds of atheists blame God for all of the evil in the world while never looking into their own heart at their personal contribution. Amen. Moreover, just because God has not stopped all of the evil yet does not negate the fact that he will set the wrongs right in the future. What a blessing to know the rest of the story. Amen. How God defeats Satan, destroys sin, and discontinues death. What a blessing to read about God Almighty remaking all things new. Without Satan, sickness, sepulchers, sorrow, or sin. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we come to the doom of the devil. After the failed revolt at the end of the millennium, Satan will finally and forever be banished and judged. Someone is appropriately quipped. When the devil brings up your past, bring up his future. Amen. The devil will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The perpetuity of Satan's punishment is clear and irrevocable. Sin first came into the universe through Lucifer's fall, and he was the subtle serpent that seduced Eve and precipitated the fall of the human race. Before the irritation of the curse is removed, the instigator of the curse will be forever exiled to the lake of fire for all eternity. Words from the hymn, When We See Christ, should express our delight at the devil's demise. Life's day will soon be o'er, all storms forever past. We'll cross the great divide 
to glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven, a harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burdens down. Amen. The final judgment. Okay. The judgment, or the judgment of the great day, is the concluding judgment after the millennium and before the new heaven and the earth. This judgment by God seated on a great white throne is synonymous or the same with the second resurrection and is referred to in a general sense as the resurrection of damnation and the resurrection of the unjust, uh, where the unsaved will wake to shame and everlasting contempt. For this reason, most attribute this judgment to only the unsaved. However, if this judgment is only for the unsaved, when will those from the millennium be judged? If this judgment is only for the unsaved, to whom are the rewards given? Uh, the passage in Revelation 11, 17 and 18 is a reference to the white throne judgment after Jesus has reigned. And at this judgment, God will reward the saints. Furthermore, the book of life is used at this judgment, not merely to show an awful blank where the name might have been, but because some names will be written in it. Overcomers from the tribulation and saints from the millennium. Most likely, this judgment of the great day will be the judgment where we, the replacement sons of God, shall judge angels. At any rate, Scripture is clear that a myriad of souls since the time of Adam will all be present at this resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. The lost world ignores the reality of the judgment because they are guilty. But there is a reason for the judgment accountability. God is just and holy and cannot allow sin and sinners to go unpunished. Earthly judges may overlook crime or take bribes and unfair sentences, but not God. He is a just God. The recall at the judgment will consist of the dead, small and great. Perhaps they will be summoned by God's voice, like Adam was on that ominous day when he tried to hide from God. God's voice may call out, where art thou? In a voice that will echo and reverberate through the universe as the dead are subpoenaed before the great white throne. First will be the small, the nobodies, the moms, the dads, the college kids, the grandparents, peasants, workers from all classes, the no-named. Next will be the great, the rich, the famous, the kings, the presidents that everyone knew, nobles, rulers. The dead will be summoned and their deeds will be stated because everything was recorded in the books. No one took the words of Christ seriously when he said, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. The results of this judgment are given in the passage, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. In view of this final judgment, we as believers have a responsibility to warn and to win others to Jesus Christ. Amen. So the day of God, amen, the day of God uh, is part of the day of the Lord in that it overlaps from the end of the millennium. It has uh, specific references to the renovation of the earth and the events immediately prior to the great white throne of judgment. The timing of the day of God corresponds to when the earth and the heaven flee away from the unveiling of God's presence and power. This unveiling is essentially God removing his clothes for the universe itself arrays and covers the glory of God from his creation. Some Bible verses teach the perpetuity of the earth, while others teach the perishing of the earth. Likewise, some verses teach the perpetuity or the continuation of the heavens, and others teach the perishing of the heavens. Both teachings are correct and co coincide with the other because the heavens and earth will be destroyed and remade. The earth as we know it now was remade from what it was before it was without form and void. And as the earth had a water baptism of judgment after Lucifer's first rebellion, it will have a baptism of fire after Satan's final rebellion. Since fire 
can merely change something from one condition to another or renovate and cleanse, we can understand the destroying of the present earth is a remaking of a new earth and essentially, with essentially the same materials. Perhaps a new earth will not consist of an inner core of fire where hell is located. Since everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels, there will be no need for hell or the bottomless pit in the new earth. Amen. The new creation is typified by the new birth of a sinner in the church age, as the fashion of this world passeth away in the day of God. So does the old man pass away in the day of the sinner's salvation. For when a man gets saved, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The converted sinner is a new creature, but in many ways he is essentially the same person because he still has the body of the old man. And as the believer experienced regeneration when he was saved, so the earth will experience a regeneration in the millennium. The earth in the kingdom age will prevail while Jesus is on the throne. Similarly, the believer can now prevail over the flesh only when the new man rules. Also, like the millennial earth, the saint, the saint in the church age still awaits the final expulsion when he drops this robe of flesh to rise and seize the everlasting prize. Originally, man was formed in the image of God. When Adam sinned, God's image in man was deformed, pushing man's image to the forefront. Now, as believers, we are to be transformed, awaiting that day when we will be conformed to the image of his Son at the rapture. Likewise, the earth awaits the day when it will be created a new earth. Amen. It's hard to miss the emphasis placed on works at the white throne of judgment. Two categories of records are at the judgment. The book of life containing the names of the saved and the books containing the deeds of the departed. Because of this glaring emphasis, most commentators relegate the white, great white throne judgment for the unsaved dead only. Uh, they would never admit someone was judged according to their works for salvation, even though those judged at this judgment are from the dispensation other than the church age. But as we highlighted earlier, saints are said to be judged at this judgment as well as sinners. Anticipation of a judgment based on works is found in every exhortation in the tribulation churches. When the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of his authority to execute judgment, he clarified that at this judgment, men are judged by their works. The punishment for a sinner's sin from an eternal God will be excessive, excruciating, and eternal. The unorthodox heresy of annihilation as taught by the Jehovah Witnesses and other groups, is clearly refuted by Scripture. Something that is everlasting does not cease or stop. The fires of eternal judgment are not quenched. They are everlasting fire. The wicked will be raised to shame and everlasting contempt. No second chance for redemption will be given at the white throne judgment. The Bible emphasizes death followed by judgment, not decision. Everyone is a believer in hell, but their sins cannot be forgiven or taken away in hell. Scripture stresses an immediate response to the gospel while a person is still living, while there is still hope. We do find, however, degrees of punishment for the wicked, just as degrees of reward are given for the righteous. The Bible speaks of the lowest hell. And the Pharisees were told they would receive a greater damnation. Abraham was not mistaken when he asked, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God knows how people and nations would have responded if they'd been given more light. God's ways are equal. Pre-Calvary Gentiles who had only their conscience to follow will be judged every man according to his deeds. Those who endured in doing well will be given eternal life. But those who were contentious and rejected the words of, and the truth of God will be punished in indignation and wrath. References to the lost sinner losing his own soul may refer to stages of a soul's degeneration 
in the lake of fire based on the severity of his punishment at the judgment. Dr. Ruckman expounded, the soul of a sinner in the lake of fire ceases to be a man and becomes like its father, the devil, a red maggot like a serpent. Hell is Darwin in reverse. It is sinners devolving from men into natural brute beasts and finally ending up in their original state. Have you ever seen a man's seed under a microscope? It looks like a worm. So when a sinner winds up in the lake of fire, he loses his bodily shape as a man and ends up as a creature with no arms, no legs, no eyes, no ears, just a writhing, squirming piece of flesh that can only feel pain. That's super scary. The new earth. The apostle Peter contrasted the destruction of the original earth with that of our present earth, stating that the current heavens and earth are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. And as the original earth was destroyed and then remade, so will our present earth be dissolved and recreated. Paradise is restored. Radio host Paul Harvey broadcast a segment of his show that he called The Rest of the Story. In this series, he would tell a story about a certain person without revealing who the person was until the end of the program. Most of the information he gave was little known to most people, and it served as a backdrop for the segment, during which he directly filled in the blanks about a well-known celebrity or event. That was, that was a good radio show. I'm Paul Harvey, and this is the rest of the story. Now, the Bible's first verse states, In the beginning God, before Lucifer was, God was. Before angels were, God was. Before man was, God was. The backstory of Lucifer's rebellion and fall is sprinkled throughout the Bible. and His demise is clearly prophesied and foretold. God's original plan and purpose for Adam was to multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it as a replacement for the fallen sons of God that had left their first estate with Lucifer's rebellion. As we know, Satan got to Adam through Eve and foiled God's plan of a sinless race ruling the earth. It would take the life, death, and resurrection of the second Adam to restore the image of God back to Adam's offspring, ensuring a sinless dominion lasting forever. Amen and amen. Without the end of the Bible, there's really no way to properly understand the beginning of the Bible. In the book of Revelation, we find the rest of the story unfold as God originally planned it. God starts with a perfect heaven and a perfect earth. This perfect heaven and earth was destroyed by judgment when Lucifer sinned and rebelled against God. The Bible ends with God making a new heaven and a new earth after he destroys the heaven and earth with fire, following another rebellion of Satan at the end of the millennium. Lucifer sinned and first shows up in Scripture as the serpent. The last mention of this arch enemy of God and instigator of evil is at the end of the Bible where he is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. After God created Adam, he put him into a, the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. In this garden was the tree of life. After Adam sinned, he was banned from the tree of life and taken from the garden. Paradise was lost. But in the new Jerusalem, paradise will be restored and the tree of life will appear again. This time, without prohibition, the Bible starts with no sin, impending man's fellowship. The, the Bible starts with no sin, impeding man's fellowship with God, and it ends with no sin, inhibiting their fellowship. The curse of sin described in Genesis, Genesis is removed in the final chapter of Revelation. Paradise that was lost will be restored at last. <laughs> amen. Amen. So who will live on the new earth? People fall under three designations, Jew, Gentile, and the church. Which of these groups will inherit the earth? <laughs> Contrary to current holistic eschatology and cultic teachings from the Jehovah Witness and Seventh-day Adventist, no one from the current age in which we lived will live on the new earth. Those who are saved in this age are the body of Christ 
and called the church his body. This body is synonymous with the wife of the Lamb and will dwell in New Jerusalem. From these three groups, only one group is promised to be the heirs of the world, the Jews. Although saved nations will be present on the new earth in some capacity and have access to both the earth and New Jerusalem, their home address may be beyond the earth's stratosphere to other worlds. The distinction of Israel's seed and name as a nation will forever exist on the new earth. So, and a new heaven. Throughout the Bible, the word heaven can refer to either a singular heaven or three different heavens. The first heaven, where the birds fly. The second heaven, where the sun and the moon reside. And the third heaven, where God's throne and abode is. This third heaven is called the heaven of heavens. Uh, John's reference to the creation of a new heaven harmonizes with the original creation as found in Genesis 1.1. Prior to the rebellion and judgment of Lucifer, other references to the new creation state new heavens in the plural because the sun and the moon as well as other vast hosts will be made new. The purpose of the new heavens. Without being too speculative, we know God does not create things arbitrarily. When God originally created earth, the earth, he formed it to be inhabited. We can conclude that the earth was inhabited prior to Adam and can validate our claim by Adam's commission when he was told to replenish the earth. But what about the heavens? Were the heavens originally made to be inhabited? Have you ever looked through a telescope or seen images from NASA? The vastness of the night sky is literally beyond our finite comprehension. So it makes you wonder. Notice the calculations of distance to the nearest star. The closest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.24 light years away. So, dwelling in the new heavens, commenting on the closing chapters of the book of Revelation, Arno Gabalian insightfully states, During the millennium, righteousness reigns upon the earth. But now... A state comes for the earth when righteousness shall dwell there. So in the new creation, righteousness is not just going to dwell on the new earth, but in the new heavens too. Dispensationalists have long conjectured that the glorious and eternal kingdom of God is not limited to one tiny planet, earth, but a kingdom without end with eternal and righteous generations. It is not too far-fetched to surmise, as commentator John Philip did, that in eternity we might well manage uh, worlds and galaxies in God's vast new empires in space. Dr. Ruckman illustrated some possible scenarios. See a new planet has been renovated by fire exact, exactly as an old car is mashed, molten, and poured anew. This earth is populated by 12 nations of men who are segregated and bounded as God originally intended. Over them stands Israel, reigning supreme in the pyramid tract of land stretching from Babylon to Cairo and from Mount Ararat to the base of that line. Uh, these all live in natural human bodies. They are born and they grow. And then at the point of 33 and a half years, oh, oh brother, they enter the new Jerusalem on the appointed month and are healed of the old sin-cursed Adamic nature where any refuse to go or rebel, they die off. Where they obey, they live forever. In a few thousand years, probably, <laughs> all are living forever. They reproduce, they're fruitful, they multiply, they replenish the earth. And uh, in 5,000 years, they overrun the earth and out go the earthlings, carried two at a time, each to be placed on a new home, a new garden of Eden. Eden restored a million times, 10 million times, 10 billion times, 100 trillion times, O oh Lord, my God, how great thou art. Amen. As theoretical as that may seem, there is some scripture corroboration behind these ideas. Perhaps vast worlds will be inhabited as a result of the increase of his government as referenced in the geographical size of the kingdom. We must first understand that the new heavens will contain the sun, moon, and stars because God promised the perpetuity of the heavens. Although New Jerusalem will not need the sun to shine on it, that does not mean there will be no sun. The reason there is no night in New Jerusalem is because the Lord giveth them light. Amen. Amen, amen. 
Neither can they die anymore. We learn from Paul that the first resurrection has three parts. Corresponding with three Jewish feasts and is represented by groups from Christ's resurrection, those at the rapture and those at the second advent. Notice, however, that everyone included in the first resurrection is protected from the second death. Christ's statement, neither can they die anymore, unquestionably applies to church A's resur resurrected and raptured saints because we will have glorified immortal bodies like Christ. Amen. Now, the two resurrections, um, the fulfillment of these promises occurs prior to the millennium and not directly prior to the new creation. Maybe Old Testament and tribulation saints will be protected from dying because they will have been awarded the right to eat of the tree of life. Amen. So there are some errors about New Jerusalem. Three erring views of the identity of New Jerusalem should be noted. First, some claim New Jerusalem is the same with the Jerusalem described in Ezekiel's vision of the millennium. Next, hyper-dispensationalists wrongly teach that New Jerusalem is redeemed Israel instead of the body of Christ from the church age. Their reason for believing this stems from the fact that the gates of the eternal city, the New Jerusalem, bear the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Finally, some Baptists claim that only members of their Baptist churches constitute the bride and will dwell in New Jerusalem. The Baptist bride claim is wrong because the church of God includes all believers. <laughs> it includes the Apostle Paul, who was not a member of the local churches he wrote to, as well as to everyone that believeth on Christ, not just local Baptist churches. The body, which is the church, is singular and corporate, not plural and local. Hyper-dispensationalist, ooh we err by denying that the apostles were in the body of Christ and are thus the foundation of the household of God. The holy apostles and prophets of the early church were in the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, government, and diversity of tongues. All the early church was Jewish, and both ordinances of the church, baptism and Lord's Supper, originate from Jewish observances. And while there is a difference between the body of Christ and Israel, there is no reason New Jerusalem cannot be designated for the church. Paul told Christians in the body of Christ that Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. Further, believers are espoused to Christ as a chaste virgin, and New Jerusalem is equated with the bride, the Lamb's wife. Claiming Paul was only using marriage as an illustration is a cop-out. Some hyper-dispensationalists evade this plain truth by claiming Paul could not be in the bride since he is one who presents the bride. The reasoning leads to foolishness. Paul also stated the Corinthians are the body of Christ. So does this mean Paul was not part of that body? Additionally, the great mystery of the believer's relationship to Christ is explained as a husband and wife relationship. Ephesians 5, 22 and 23. That ties these verses with 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and it solidifies the truth that the body of Christ is the same as the body of his bride, for the two shall be one flesh. New Jerusalem is said to be the bride, the Lamb's wife. While Israel is God the Father's wife, Hosea 2, if the bride of the Lamb is Israel, then God the Father violated his own laws. The mistaken notion that only believing Israel will participate in the actual marriage of the Lamb comes from not paying attention to the wording 
of the parable of the ten virgins. Finally, if you equate New Jerusalem with Ezekiel's vision of Jerusalem in the millennium, you create more problems than you solve. The measurements of the two cities are nowhere close being the, to being the same. The trees in earthly Jerusalem during the millennium are not the tree of life, and the river in the millennium, Jerusalem, comes out of the literal earthly temple in the millennial city, not the throne. There is no temple in New Jerusalem, but the temple is the center of worship in Jerusalem during the millennium. Amen. So, uh, when does New Jerusalem descend? Uh, many dispensationalists, like Schofield, believe New Jerusalem will descend at the beginning of the kingdom age and be suspended over the millennial Jerusalem. They insist uh, the verses after Revelation 21, 1-8 give a recap recapitulation of the millennial age in order to describe more fully that period of time. Perhaps they allocate these verses uh, to the millennium to dodge the implications of human propagation and dependence on the tree of life. If New Jerusalem descends to the earth in Byron's to hover over the earth throughout the millennium, how could Jesus be both reigning on the throne of David in earthly Jerusalem and on the throne of God and of the Lamb? No, no. New Jerusalem will descend after the white throne judgment simultaneously with the recreation of the new heaven and the new earth, whereas Jerusalem in the millennium is a type of New Jerusalem in the new creation, they are not the same. And while the new heavens and new earth are prophesied in the same chapters of the Bible, Jerusalem on the earth in the millennium is not the same as Jerusalem above the earth in the new creation. If they are the same, death and accursed souls would be present in the new heavens and new earth. In summary, Abraham, the father of faith, for both Jews in the Old Testament and Christians in this age, set the precedent, precedent when he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And while he was looking for a literal physical city on this earth, we desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. The Jews will get their earthly Mount Zion, and we, believers in the church age, will get the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. May we fully realize that here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. So God's plan, God's plan resumed. Uh, uh, back in chapter one, we unpacked some of God's revealed truth as to his eternal purpose. We also established the fact that God's plan of creating the universe, along with the cherubim, seraphim, and the rest of the angels, was a wonderful plan intended to bring God pleasure, but the problem of sin, which originated and spread through Lucifer, led to judgment and the subsequent creation of man. In response, the plot of Satan was launched, enacted by his seduction of Eve, and made effective by Adam's disobedience. The penalty of sin resulted in death and hell, and only through the propitiation of Christ's redeeming blood can God offer fallen creation be restored and redeemed. In every dispensation, man's corrupt history tells of a dis dismal failure. Only through the redeeming worth of the last Adam will man's future resume as God originally intended. Amen. We begin, we began this chapter addressing the question of evil and suffering in the world, and we end this chapter with the answer. The answer is not a program politics, policies, philosophies, or preferences. The answer is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. The evil and suffering brought into the universe by Satan will forever be banished by God. All because of the redemptive work accomplished by the Lamb of God. Redeemed souls will serve, worship, praise, and adore God forever and ever just 
as he originally intended. Saints from all ages, past and future, will enjoy the presence of God in eternal bliss, happiness, and joy. We often think of what heaven will be like. Scripture illuminates the glories of heaven by telling us what it will not be like. <laughs> and that's Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. When the great day of judgment comes, God will say, no more. There will be no more Satan and seduction, no more deception, no more devil. There will be no more sea, no more deep, no more division between God and his people. There will be no more sickness and sepulchers. Death will die. The new creation will be a place of erased tears and empty tombs. There will be no more sorrow, depression, discouragement, disappointment, dilution, disillusionment will be gone. Crying and pain will not even be a memory, nor come to mind. There will be no more sin. Bad deeds that end in damnation will not be done. With no tree of evil, there will be no more test or need for man's testing. And when all is said and done, there will be no more scoffers. There will be no more dissenters, only residents of this place we call heaven. Heaven is a prepared place, a pure place, a precious place, a place where the presence of God will be all in all. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. I hope that this series was a blessing to you as it was to me and it's just good to know that you know that you know and that we can believe and trust the God of this book and every single word that he has spoken and preserved in this book for us others may hear all the truth we just heard and it sounds like a Hollywood movie or a fantasy novel to them. But we know that our God cannot lie and he means what he says and he says what he means. Oh, thank God. Thank God for Jesus and the King James Bible. Amen. God bless you. We'll, uh, we'll be thinking about and get ready to start the new series are you nuts for nuggets? <laughs> you know I love you. We'll see you then.